Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Infineon with Shibram Trakutam. We're going to talk today about why connectivity is changing microcontrollers. Microcontrollers have been in use for a very long time. They've been in use in, in homes. They've been in use in uh, industrial settings, offices. What's changing now and why is it changing? Okay, good question. So, uh, it's more than changing, it's the, these are evolving, right? Um, so the whole range of products, I'll give you a few examples. Let's say the thermostats in your house or a smoke detector or, or a garage door opener or, or the thing that controls your sprinklers in the backyards. All these devices have existed. They've been digitized to some extent. So they've used microcontrollers for a long time. Now what's happening is all of these devices are getting connected to the internet. They're getting smarter by getting connected to the internet. And the act of bringing connectivity to these devices brings in a whole lot of new complexities to these devices in the, by, by way of the compute power required in them, the, the memory required in them, the security capabilities that are, that are required in them. And these are causing these microcontrollers to evolve into a new breed of microcontrollers, which we could loosely call connected microcontrollers, which is they bring connectivity and microcontrollers into single products. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Shivram, what are we looking at here? Um, you're looking at a typical IoT product, a typical IoT system here. Now, all the products that I mentioned earlier, to the examples that I gave earlier, thermostats or smoke detectors and garage door openers and so on, those used to be built with MCUs. They still are. And these MCUs have, of course, various facets to them, security, memory, the compute power, and so on and so forth. Now, once you once you connect these products to the internet, and the primary technologies you use there are Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, this impacts not just the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, uh, subsystems in the product, but also impacts the capabilities on the MCU security and memory that are required. For instance, the MCU needs to be more capable now in terms of the, in terms of the clock speeds and the hardware it has because it has to run the internet uh, protocol, the, the networking stacks, not just of Wi-Fi, but also of the internet protocols. Likewise with, with Bluetooth. The security has to, be, uh, has to be more enhanced now because now you have an additional attack vector, so to speak, through, through, through the connectivity. So the security needs to get enhanced as well. Um, but all the other parts of the, of the system, like whether it's got a display or, a, or, or some button, some kind of a interface to the user, LEDs, sensors, and analog, those are largely the same because the devices themselves, whether it's a sprinkler controller or a smoke detector and so on, is largely still the same. The changes come due to the fact that they're getting connected, and that's why you need these new breed of microcontrollers, which we call connected uh, connected microcontrollers. And when you look at this, in the past, an MCU pretty much was was a one function, right? It didn't really do much more than one simple thing. In a lot of these cases, the memory was on the MCU. That was what you were limited to. Now you've got all this connectivity. You've got ex ex the possibility of expanded way beyond the MCU, right? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point to bring up. So. There are, it, uh, the, the IoT space is very broad. So the applications vary from very simple applications to relatively, uh, to, to medium complexity to large complexity. So there's no one size fits all. So products like the ones uh, we build, of course they have, they have memory on chip. And for some applications that's enough, but for some it's not. And you need the provision to be able to expand your memory capability. So these products also come with memory expansion capabilities. You, you typically have uh, quad spy interfaces through which you can expand the memory both in terms of your non-volatile memory, uh, that is the flash required, and in terms of the working memory, right? That's the, that's the PSRAM, right? So you could have external components off of these interfaces. And then, of course, these interfaces now then lead to additional security challenges. So you need to have on-the-fly encryption and decryption when you're moving data in and out of the microcontroller. So these modern connected microcontrollers come with provisions to expand the memory uh, to suit the application needs. And you're also moving more data around than you were in the past too, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, there's a lot of data being moved around. And also when you, when you have a cloud connected device, then there needs to be some periodic, um, I mean, let's call it uh, a periodic heartbeat kind of a function where the, the internet service or the cloud service that the product is connected to needs to know that you're still connected to the network. So there needs to be a constant stream of data, albeit not that much, but there needs to be a constant stream of data that's going up to the cloud. 
and then there's more data that's moved inside a inside a product, and that depends on the application with uh, the IoT product that you're building. One of the challenges that we deal with in a lot of these devices is just the ability to be able to connect them in a way that uh, doesn't take up an entire day and you're frustrated trying to, this is connected to this, why is this not working correctly? You really want to be able to do almost plug and play, right? That, that's the biggest problem for IoT, IoT development today, right? Uh, for teams that are not used to having connectivity in their products, they've been building products traditionally for many, many years, and now there's the additional challenge of connecting these products to the internet, you have to figure out a lot of details, right? And that's, that adds to the amount of investment, the number of engineers required, mm -hmm. and also it, it detracts from your main focus. Like for instance, if I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm a garage door opener or if I'm making a grill, I want to focus on making the world's best grill or the world's best garage door opener, not have to figure out how to get my connectivity to work and uh, how to get an app to run and so on and so forth, right? So this is an important aspect of products like this. Um, in order to shorten the development effort and uh, the investment required to bring such products to the market, you need to have certain pre-integrated components, certain standard functions. Like for instance, every IoT product needs a way to upgrade the software in the field, over the air software update. I mean, you found a bug, you found a security loophole, whatever it is, you need to be able to push a new software image to your product. Every IoT developer doesn't have to figure out how to do that. They need these product needs to come with something standard that's pre-verified as a library component that an engineer could use and focus on the more important things that the product needs to do. So those are the common challenges. How do you how do you get this connected to Wi-Fi? How do you meet all the standards? How do I get the product certified for for all my standards? Uh, how do I take the product to production, right? A high volume production, and how do I take care of the common functions I talked about, which is over the air software update, device onboarding, and so on and so forth. That, that, that's the range of problems a general embedded uh, software designer faces while building IoT products like this. What we're talking about here is really the rudiments of a smart home. Does this apply to other industries as well? Sure, I mean, the same patterns apply to the broad industrial space as well. And when I say industrial, I, just don't, I don't just mean factories and, and industrial automation. Yes, that too but also applications like, let's say, uh, vending machines that have to get connected, or advertising displays that have to get, uh, I mean, get connected, uh, elevator controls that need to get, a whole range of building automation, commercial, um, uh, enterprise, application, logistics, and so on and so forth, which we broadly classify under the bucket of industrial, all of those have similar uh, patterns and requirements to the smart home products. One of the big concerns, and you've addressed some of this here, is security because the more things that you have connected, the more you have one point of contact to be able to get into everything, right? Yes. Uh, so that's, I mean, there are there are multiple layers. I mean, like security is always built in layers. You don't have, you can't build one layer of security and, and hope the product is secure. So you need to have multiple levels of security. And one is, of course, security on the connectivity side. So the, so the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, which bring data in and out, of the network need to be secure, and there are standards that govern these. Um, you need to meet all of those those standards, and then there are the product specific details, which is how do I boot a product? Where is my boot image? Can I can I make the boot image tamper proof? When I'm updating my 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 software image to a to a newer software image, how do I make sure that I don't leave a backdoor open for a malicious actor to put their own firmware on it and take over the product. So all those need to be built into the design of the IoT product. But the flip side of that is now you also say, okay, we can now secure this at the router level, right? The Wi-Fi router. So instead of just the individual products, which may have password one as a default on there, now you're coming through and saying, this is connected. You can't get into this unless you break my Wi-Fi router. And my Wi-Fi router is going to be different than yours. Yeah, that's that's the thing about security. It's not. It's there are so many angles through which you could break into a product. So you need multiple defenses, right? You could, for instance, uh, break in through a router and get into a product. You could directly break into the into the product as well. Uh, so the multiple attack surfaces, as they call, and you need to cover all of them. Now the part you brought up about the router, yes, there are multiple manufacturers, but all of those manufacturers and, and suppliers have to follow the standards mm -hmm. that are laid out by the Wi-Fi Alliance and the IEEE uh, fora that, that govern the requirements for Wi-Fi routers, which make sure that these products are um, not vulnerable uh, to bad actors. And of course, 
Security again is not a static thing; it keeps moving, um, and 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 even the standards for Wi-Fi keep evolving. There is a set of people who are constantly on the lookout for these kinds of threats, and they update the standards to to make sure we take care of the latest threat, and that software gets pushed into these routers. So security is not a is a static thing; it keeps moving, and you need to cover them. Uh, multiple defenses, and then each of those defenses need to keep 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 pace with the the current security threats. Another piece that you you brought up here, which is interesting, is that it's no longer just one chip for the whole device. It's now multiple chips that do do different things, and so you're getting much more granular about what you need within that device, right? Yes and no. So you could have multiple multiple chips, uh, like for instance, you could use a Wi-Fi chip and an MCU and a Bluetooth, and put all of this together. Uh, technically, that's doable, but that takes a lot of effort. And like I was mentioning earlier, there are certain set of common functions that any IoT product has to do. And each embedded developer doesn't and need not figure, it's very inefficient for each of them to figure out all these things by themselves. So bringing all of these together and laying a common foundation for the basic functions that every IoT product needs, connectivity, security, uh, onboarding, all of that helps take away the, the, the complexities in the development and allows the embedded engineers to focus on what makes their product unique compared to the other products they're competing with in their, in their markets. So that's one of the products that, uh, that, that, that we launched. I mean, we call it the 5591 connected microcontroller family that actually brings microcontrollers, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth all onto a common product. Now, silicon is one aspect. Okay, we bring all of that onto, onto a single piece of silicon, a single chip. The more important aspect uh, is, is, is the software. We also bring the software for all these components together onto a common platform. So, for instance, the real-time operating system that runs on this on this processor, the Wi-Fi drivers, the Wi-Fi connection managers, uh, the Bluetooth stacks, uh, the tools that an embedded developer would need to certify this product and get FCC and and, and WFA certifications, and all the common functions that I referred to earlier, the over the software, all those are pre-baked into the software that comes with the product, allowing our customers or embedded developers to be able to develop their IoT product quickly and get to market. But if you have, for example, an image sensor, that's going to be much more power intensive, right? So now you can say, okay, we've just changed the rules here. We don't have to, we put everything that matters for you on one chip, and now we've also taken all the back stuff and say we put this on a different chip. Yeah, excellent. That's that's a, that's a, that's a great thing you bring up, right? So that's a little different kind of a system. So let's look at an IP camera. You talked about image sensor. So an, an IP camera typically has an image sensor in this. Uh, I should I should call it an image processor, which is typically a high-end uh, A-class uh, MPU, right? It's uh, it's typically very power hungry, right? And now if you use this and, and you use this and you build, let's say, an IP camera, right? This is, and, and let's say this is a battery operated IP camera. The things that you might, you might put in your backyard or in the front of your house and, and you can pull up your phone app and, 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 and you can look at your backyard view or your front yard, uh, front yard view anytime, even when you're not home. Now this kind of a camera connects to the internet in your home uh, over Wi-Fi, right? And this connects to the internet, so basically to a to the cloud, right? And you are somewhere remote with your smartphone, right? And you have a app on your smartphone, and you could use this app to uh, to communicate over the internet with your camera and say, "Hey, I want to look at the the backyard uh, view now, right?" Now, if this is a battery operated camera, given that this is a very power consuming uh, chip, if you keep this on all the time in anticipation of you having to uh, command the camera to view your uh, view your backyard, it's going to drain the battery very quickly, right? And you're going to have days of battery life, whereas you would like to have months worth of battery life. What it can do is keep the image processor turned off for as long as possible and take care of all the housekeeping functions like staying connected to the cloud, the heartbeat information to the cloud saying, are you still there? Yep, I'm still here. All of those kinds of housekeeping functions, monitoring local wake-up uh, events and so on, can be done by a low-power connected microcontroller, allowing the more high-power uh, I mean, component like an image processor to sleep most of the while. So this can easily extend the battery life of, of, a, of a camera like this from days to months, right? So that's another way in which this product can be, 
used. We've had a lot of these functions before. What's different here? Good question again. So each of these functions independently exist. Now, what's different here is each of these functions have become better, significantly better. Now, if you look at the Wi-Fi portion, right, this supports the latest uh, IoT uh, standards, which are Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, right? And this is, this is essential because in homes, like we talked about earlier, all manner of devices are getting connected. And homes are moving anywhere from 30 to 35 uh, connected devices to over 50, 60 connected devices in, in the upcoming year. So there's a lot of density in, in modern homes, multiple devices being connected. And not only your home, your neighbor's home is doing the same, right? And it's, it's going to interfere with your, your Wi-Fi. So the density of Wi-Fi connected devices is increasing. So you need to keep pace with the standards. And Wi-Fi 6 allows or has techniques built into it which, uh, which, which allow it to more gracefully handle these situations of multiple devices on the same networks, right? So we do support that. And then we go above and beyond what the standard requirements call for Wi-Fi 6 and 6E, which is improve the performance, particularly the RF performance, so that the range of these connections is higher. Now, typical Wi-Fi connected devices up until now, whether it's your smartphone or your, or your laptop, it's generally used in the living room or in a, or in a bedroom kind of, a, uh, kind of a situation which has stronger signal uh, uh, I mean, to your, to, your, to your home access point. These kind of IoT devices now, your garage door openers, backyard sprinkler controllers, spoke grid, they're used in your basement, outside the house, have to go through multiple walls and so on and so forth. So the challenges for these devices is, is a little, is, is different from the challenges you face with your smartphone or your laptop. So this range, reliability, even though the data rate itself, you may not need 100 Mbps for, for a product like this, maybe, two or five MBPS is more than enough. Uh, but the range and reliability for these products is essential. So we've improved the Wi-Fi technology in this, uh, in this product to be able to enhance uh, up to 40% more range than, than the previous products. Likewise with the Bluetooth, right? The Bluetooth is an essential component of it. It supports the, the new standard, which is LE long range, which enhances the, the range by orders of magnitude up to four to 10 times more, depending on how you configure it, right? And we've made that better too. And on the MCU side, all the parameters we talked about earlier, that is the, that is the clock speed here, the, the MIPS that you have, the security, the memory, the expansion of the memory and all the peripherals that we have, there's incremental improvements in each of these, making it the next generation, uh, uh, next generation connected microcontroller. Shivran Trakutam, thanks for a great explanation. No problem. Thank you. It was great being on your show, and I hope your, your, your audience found this interesting too.